responded to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Those are both crucial to our success. So with that, I am thrilled to welcome LSE colleagues Martin Reed, Deputy Director and Head of Academic Services, and Anna Tolson, Archives and Special Collections Manager, who will talk about the integrated approach they are taking with their collections. RLP Executive Director Rachel Frick and I visited with LSE staff, and we were so impressed by their approach, uh, So, and we asked them to uh, please share with us and I'm very gratified uh, to welcome them here today. So I'm going to take just a moment and transfer. Um, well, first I'm going to switch the slides over to the LSE slides, and then I'm going to transfer control to our colleagues and take them off of mute. So you are ready to present. Please take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Lee. Um, uh, and uh, hello and uh, um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Martin Reed. I'm the Deputy Director of LSE Library and Head of Academic Services, uh, and I'm presenting uh, this afternoon with my colleague uh, Anna Towson. Um, and we're very pleased to have this opportunity to be able to share um, some of the things that we've been doing with the development, the development of our uh, unique and distinctive collections with you, um, and uh, very grateful for um, uh, for Merrily in asking us to. Uh, to do uh, to do this webinar this afternoon, so uh, we're just going to kick uh, kick right off and uh, uh, and start now. So, uh, yeah, this is, these are the things that we um, intend to cover uh, this afternoon. Um, I want to start by giving you some background and context to uh, LSE, the London School of Economics, um, and its library. Um, and then talk about some of the uh, the drivers that have uh, we've that have been moving us forward and that we've needed to to respond to and that have caused us to uh, to, to to make some of the changes that we're talking about this afternoon. Um, then look in a bit more detail at the new roles that we've created to handle these these changes um, and a particular piece of work that has been instrumental in the developments that we've been making. That's a, a, a comprehensive evaluation of our collections. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague Anna, who will talk about the, the achievements of the, the, the staff in the new roles and some of the challenges that we've faced. Uh, and then I'll pick up um, very briefly at the end with some of the, some of the plans that we have for the future. Um, so to start with some uh, context for uh, for what's been happening, um, just for those of you who um, who don't know a huge amount about um, the LSE, uh, just to give you some facts and figures. Um, so we're the, at the London School of Economics and Political Science, generally known as LSE, uh, and you may uh, and when we're talking, you may you may find us um, referring to the school, and that's what we're we're talking about, the LSE. Um, it's one of the world's leading social science universities, um, founded in 1895, um, and uh, it was founded to um, understand the causes of things. Its motto is to understand the causes of things, um, and it, it, it was dedicated to uh, improving society through the study and analysis of social issues. Um, it's grown steadily over the last 120 years um, and now has a very um, international staff and student body with approximately 11,000 students, about 5,000 5, undergraduate and 6,000 postgraduate, about, about 5,000 um, master's students and probably about 1,000 um, PhDs. Um, 3,300 academic staff um, and support staff across all of the usual professional support um, um, roles, um, grouped in a total of 23 academic departments and institutes and uh, nearly as many research centres focusing on different aspects of the social sciences. Um, the, the school as a whole covers the full range of social science subjects from 
anthropology to social psychology, uh, uh, government, public policy, economics, finance and accounting, history, um, uh, but also maths and stats uh, and philosophy. So um, although it's a subject focus, it is quite, uh, it, we, we interpret that quite broadly. The library, um, LSE's library, um, is the British Library of Political and Economic Science, um, which was founded just a year after the school, um, with the aim of uh, systematically collecting the material from around the world to support the work of the school um, uh, and to be effectively a, labor a laboratory for the social sciences. So after 120 years, we now have a world-class collection which was supports research and teaching at the school um, and beyond. Uh, and there are just some figures there about the, uh, the size of the collection, the rough size of the collection. We're talking about um, maybe a million and a half printed items, books, journals, and pamphlets, uh, along with archives, photographs, and museum objects. We're very lucky in that we're well resourced with a materials budget of around three and a half million and a total of 93 staff based on a single site in central London. 90% um, of our materials on open access and 10% is on closed access on site. Um, we have no more expansion space and that's something we'll come on to in, um, shortly and we're just beginning to explore the use of off-site storage to, to handle that. We are one of five national research libraries within the UK which receives additional funding from the Central Funding Agency in recognition of the particular role that we play in supporting research at the national level. Um, and uh, we do have, we take that national role very seriously and are open to external researchers uh, and the public as well as supporting LSE's research and teaching. So moving on to look at what are the factors driving change, what, what has been happening that's made us reevaluate how we handle archives and special collections and what we do with them. A lot of them are the same as those which are affecting um, all higher education institutions, certainly in the UK and I think more broadly. Um, and those are to do with a cultural shift towards, towards digital as the default way of consuming information um, or media. Um, and what that means for the, the role of the physical artifact. Um, we were thinking about this and um, part of that cultural shift in which the digital becomes ubiquitous, um, I think means that uh, where people encounter physical artifacts or those encounters with physical artifacts become uh, less common um, and, pa and perhaps counterintuitively, or maybe not, they become more significant for those who, who do manage to have those encounters with the physical artifact. Um, and I think by extension, for us, it becomes more important for us to find ways of providing opportunities for researchers, for students to encounter physical artifacts. So we need to, we were thinking about um, how, we, how we do that in this, in this digital environment. Some other broader, broad themes, um, the, the, the growing importance of the student experience, the UK um, it, institutions improving that um, and trying to understand what that means in terms of a library space. Uh, we're being used as um, a very popular study space and that means that we need to think about the balance between uh, stock on shelves and the type of study spaces that we provide. Uh, and that also has some implications for for how we manage and handle our collections. Um, in addition to those broad generic uh, issues, there are some things which are specific to the LSE, um, and those are particularly the acquisition of the Women's Library collection, which came to us in 2013, so five years ago now. The Women's Library is an internationally significant collection um, of, his, of, of the history of women's suffrage and activism. And uh, we brought it in when its previous home was no longer able to, 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 to look after it. Um, it led that, that, it, that ingest of that collection led to a big, a big shift in uh, what we, how we approach archives. We were, we, we, it effectively doubled the size of our, our archival holdings or the number of archival collections that we had and meant that we had to make some significant changes in the physical arrangement of the building in order to accommodate it. One of those was 
the creation of a library exhibition gallery. We'd never had an exhibition space before, um, and the Women's Library had a long history of um, providing exhibition space for its collections, not least because it includes a lot of museum objects. Um, and so our, part of our commitment to taking, into, taking in that collection and uh, continuing its work was to provide uh, an exhibition space, which was something new for us. That in turn meant that we, we were then faced with, uh, when, we, when, we were, when we had finally created that gallery a year or, or so later, we were then faced with an exhibition space which we needed to, to fill um, and to produce um, a regular program of high quality exhibitions. Um, and we needed to think about how we were going to do that, how we were going to resource that. Um, so, how did we respond to those uh, to those um, drivers, to those those uh, those things pushing for change? Um, well, following extensive discussion within the leadership team after our, a new library director was appointed, um, we developed a, a new library strategy which put a renewed focus on collections, which which re um, resituated collections at the heart of the strategy. Um, and that strategy, um, we wanted within that strategy, what we wanted to do was to give unique and distinctive collections and grasp the opportunity which we saw for unique and distinctive collections for playing a greater role in making a contribution to the education, research, public engagement, and fundraising activities of the institution as a whole. Um, these are, we, we, we felt that the UDCs could make a, a major contribution to all of these key aspects of the, school, the school's activities. So in order to achieve these objectives, we felt that we had to do a number of things. The most important of which was to understand the collections better, and particularly those unique and distinctive collections. Um, and this led us to think about how we could do that. Um, and the, Conclusions that we came to were that we needed to to to, to do to undertake a collection evaluation, um, a really in-depth, thorough collection evaluation, which we hadn't done before, which had never really been done in the last the previous 120 years, um, and uh, to, to understand what we have and how we could make best use of it, and also that we needed to devote resources to um, achieving this by creating new roles. Um, we felt this would have additional benefits in freeing up, uh, up other staff to, to concentrate on, uh, on other functions, um, and that by uh, um, integrating our um, approach towards uh, the understanding and management of collections, primary sources, archives, special collections, and print, this would enable us to, um, to be much more effective in what we were doing. So if we have a look at the, the new roles that we, uh, that we wanted to introduce um, uh, in a bit more detail now, um, the, 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 the most important of those was the curator role. Um, we felt that there was a need for a collection or content specialist post that could bridge the gap between archives and special collections and more mainstream library collections, particularly those collections um, which constituted primary, primary materials for social science scholarship, um, such as statistics, official publications, and so, so on. So in thinking about what uh, um, this, this new role, this bridging role, this curator role could do, we wanted um, one or more dedicated posts that could research collections, identify uh, our unique and distinctive collections, be clear about what our unique and distinct collections were and build up on those strengths, promote use of the, the UDCs um, in the institution, um, incorporate them into teaching, um, and raise awareness of them both within and outside of the, the institution, um, contribute to um, the program that we wanted to develop around education and outreach um, outside of the institution, as well as uh, as well as to the teaching um, within the institution itself, uh, and also to identify priorities for, for digitisation. So, in order to do this, we felt that we should adopt a thematic approach, focusing on the core areas of collection strength, which we had already identified, um, and these 
came down to three, three areas, economic and social policy, politics and international relations, and equality rights and citizenship. And so what we did was to, to draw, draw up job descriptions for three roles for curators for each of those thematic areas. Um, that curator role, um, we felt would, um, as I already touched on, would have uh, some additional benefits. It would um, uh, work closely with other teams. Um, with academic liaison, it would um, enable, um, by having the expertise to focus on um, uh, unique and distinctive connections, it would free up the, the liaison team to, uh, to focus on building uh, relationships with their um, with their academic departments, um, but uh, would enable us to build in to bring um, expertise collection expertise to bear um, in con when the liaison team um, would work uh, in uh, in conjunction with the curators. Uh, similarly, with learning support, um, it would. Um, uh, be able to make a contribution to skills training um, around uh, primary sources uh, and archival sources, um, and in the outreach area, provide um, content for exhibitions and various other outreach activities, public events that we were we were hoping to develop. Um, and then within the remit of the archives team, by concentrating. Um, responsibilities for unique and distinctive collections and um, particularly their use uh, in these curator roles, um, we felt it would free up resources to focus on uh, more technical aspects that needed attention, such as cataloguing and description. Um, so the three posts, we, we created job descriptions for these posts, one in each thematic area. Um, we didn't have any additional resources. Um, there was no additional funding for this. Um, we had to do it within our existing staffing complement. Um, so the way we did that was to um, open up those posts to um, librarians and archivists, um, and um, the successful applicants for those posts, we would then convert them into curator, curator roles. So we developed a job description um, and recruited from the existing team. Um, we were lucky. We have a very talented team of librarians and archivists here, um, and we had three people who were um, prepared to put themselves forward and were excited by the new roles, um, and we were able to make the appointments in, in January 2016. Um, the other role, new role that we had created was that of Education and Outreach Officer. Um, and the thinking behind that was to build on the outreach program, the education and outreach program that the, uh, the Women's Library had successfully developed, um, and to engage with schools and community groups with, uh, with LSE collections. Again, this was a new area for us. We hadn't really done a great deal of work in this area. Um, and we felt that we, if we were going to do more of this or if we were going to continue this strand of activity, we needed to, uh, again, have dedicated, a dedicated post to, to do this. Um, we were able to fund this um, by getting some additional money from the National Funding Agency uh, in the UK, the Higher Education Funding Council, um, which had a dedicated fund for museums, galleries, and collections within higher education. And we made an application to that fund and were successful in receiving enough money to, to fund um, a, a full-time post in the first instance for two years. Uh, and then we were um, very pleased to have that funding renewed last year for a further five years. Um, and that's how we've been able to, to, to fund this post. Um, its purpose is to, um, is to develop a program for outreach with schools and to develop digital resources for, for teachers and schools. Um, it also takes the lead in the library's public events program, which is another new development for us. We've done a lot more. Um, uh, we've been able to do a lot more uh, public events around our collections as a result of having the capacity that this post gives us and the curator's role give us, and to liaise with the, with the school's existing widening participation uh, and events team, and to and to help out with uh, with um, exhibitions. 
Um, and then the final part of this um, sort of con context and background uh, about uh, what, what we did was uh, the collection evaluation. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, was a um, an essential part. We felt this was an essential part of what we wanted to do. Um, in order to make the most of our collection, we needed to understand it better, and we felt to do that we needed a comprehensive assessment of the intellectual value and significance of our collections. Um, this would help us to identify and clarify those unique and distinctive collections and help us to draw up uh, priorities for retention, storage and disposal uh, of material, enable us to effectively manage stock and space, uh, and to work out priorities for, for digitization. And the approach that we took was to um, uh, uh, develop a four-level hierarchy um, and then to assess um, at the collection level, uh, the, uh, the, the quality of um, our collections against a range of criteria, um, including um, um, a degree of rarity or uniqueness and relevance to research and teaching needs. Um, so those four levels uh, are identified there, flagship, heritage, current research and teaching, and low priority. Um, and just to give you a quick rundown on what what those mean for us. So for us, we were taking, for our definition, we, we decided that flagship was a collection of national significance which focus, focuses on subjects of significant interest, such as events, people, movements, ideas, and organizations which had a, rec um, a recognized and last, lasting impact on society, which in terms of their quality are central to the understanding and appreciation of the subject. Um, and so are extensive in coverage, uh, cover, the, cover a particular subject in depth, uh, and include an extensive range of original archives, printed primary sources that directly evidence the subject, um, as well as a comprehensive range of secondary sources which discuss and interpret the subject and um, uh, contain a, a significant quantity of unique and rare material. Um, we were also, um, in terms of the research, um, that they needed to make a major contribution to the public's understanding of the subject, be an active focus for academic research, um, and uh, support or have the potential to support uh, student learning, outreach, and knowledge exchange, uh, as well as having a strong history of being accessed by a wide range of users. Um, heritage um, was essentially similar but less significant. So primary sources but lacking the depth, breadth and uniqueness of flagship but not easily accessible elsewhere in the UK um, and therefore still of significance uh, but just not at the same level. Current research and teaching, fairly self-explanatory, um, standard collections which support the research and teaching of the institution and then essentially um, low priority is everything else. Um, uh, and we um, uh, undertook a project to, to uh, conduct that collection evaluation. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to, um, to Anna, uh, who has the, uh, has the joy of leading that project, and she's going to tell you a bit more about it and its outcomes. Thank you, Martin, and hello, everyone. So, I'll start by outlining the results of the collection evaluation project in relation to our flagship collections as these are the collections that the, which the new roles are focusing on as the collections which have the greatest potential to support teaching, research and public engagement. So our flagship collections comprise archives, printed primary sources and supporting material relating to British political and economic history, and in particular the work of national pressure groups, campaigners, reformers and think tanks and their efforts to influence public debate and policy. So some of our main subject strengths are illustrated on the slide. So peace and internationalism, represented by the leaflet advertising one of the older Marston marches, a protest demonstration against nuclear weapons, which was held annually during the 1960s. In the middle, women's equality and rights, represented by the banner design for the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. And on the right, poverty and welfare, represented by an image from Street Life in London, a series of photographs with accompanying articles documenting poverty on the streets of Victorian London. 
other flagship collections, or other flagship strengths rather, are LGBT equality and rights, Britain's relationship with Europe, and the development of left-wing thought in the UK. So these are the collections that our curator, our curators and our education officer are focusing their attention on. But what have they been doing? So I'll start with exhibitions and public engagement, as overall this is probably the area where we've made the most progress. So over the past three years, we've developed a program of exhibitions and events based on our flagship collections to raise awareness and understanding of our collections, the people and movements that created them, and the stories that they tell, and to encourage discussion and reflection on the themes that they cover. We decided at an early stage to hold three exhibitions a year, with the curators taking it in turns to design and curate them. To go with each exhibition, we hold a series of public events based around the exhibition theme, developed jointly by the education officer and the curators. And we also hold additional events to tie in with internal initiatives, such as LSE's Research Festival, and external initiatives, such as LGBT History Month. Initially, our events followed LSE's traditional public lecture format, so a 45-minute evening lecture or panel discussion followed by questions. But over the past year, we've been experimenting with a range of different formats to appeal to a range of different audiences. So shorter lunchtime talks, in-conversation events, poetry readings, and musical performances. Last academic year, our exhibitions attracted over 28,500 visits in total, and we held 39 public events with over 1,900 attendees, which is not bad considering we only began developing the program in 2015. But we're also trying to capture impact beyond simply numbers of visitors, and I have a couple of examples of this that I'd like to share with you. So firstly, an example of impact within LSE, and our Journeys to Independence exhibition, which is illustrated on the slide. This was held to mark the centenary in 2017 of Indian independence and the birth of Western East Pakistan. Time to sit alongside a series of events and activities organized by LSE's South Asia Center. The display considered the recent history of the Indian subcontinent, including material related to the civil disobedience movement, women campaigning in India for birth control, and the founding of Pakistan and Bangladesh. It also highlighted LSE's historic relationship with the region, and in particular, LSE alumnus and champion of Dalit rights, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. The exhibition generated significant goodwill for the library, not just within the South Asia Centre, but also within the school more generally. And this is really illustrated by these two comments from the visitor's book, the first from the head of the South Asia Centre, and the second from an LSE student. And Martin's already flagged up that we have, uh, our student body is very international. Um, uh, so we were very pleased that, uh, that the South Asian community within LSE enjoyed the exhibition and made it, uh, one of the, the comment reads, it makes me proud to go to LSE and to be an Indian. The second example I'd like to share is our At Last Votes for Women exhibition, again illustrated on this slide, held in summer 2018 as the centerpiece of our Suffrage 18 program, a year-long series of events and activities marking the centenary of the Representation of the People Act, which gave some women in Britain the right to vote for the first time. The exhibition used archives and objects from the Women's Library collection to explore the campaign methods of three main groups campaigning for women's suffrage, and it also covered the last and often bitter years of the long struggle for women's rights to vote, featuring diaries and drawings made by suffragettes imprisoned for their militant activities. This exhibition att attracted a significant number of external visitors, and these comments from the visitors' book give an insight into the impact it made on them. The display clearly had a particular resonance for women, prompting them to reflect about what it must have been like not to be able to vote. The determination of the campaigners and the personal sacrifices individuals made as part of the campaign. But it's also clear that many found the stories featured in the exhibition inspiring. We've also begun to put on digital exhibitions. Earlier this year, we joined Google's arts and culture platform, with one of our curators working with Google to create eight stories showcasing our suffrage collections. The slide shows one of these, focusing on a series of beautiful designs for suffrage banners by the artist Mary Lowndes. 
We're not sure yet in the longer term how we'll use this platform in the future, whether we'll develop digital, ex exhibit, digital exhibits to complement our, our gallery ex exhibitions, or whether we'll develop a separate program of digital exhibitions, or indeed a mixture of the two. The new roles have also increased our capacity to support teaching and learning activities based on our flagship collections, both within and beyond the higher education sector. We've had limited success so far within LSE. Over the past year, eight courses across four different departments incorporated teaching sessions based on our collections, but 75% of these are long-standing arrangements predating the appointment of the curators although the curators have been able to work with course leaders to refresh and update the content. The image on the slide references London Geographies, an undergraduate course exploring the political, economic and social geography of London. And this includes a session in the library looking at the archive of Charles Booth's inquiry into life and labour in London, an investigation into poverty in the capital in the late 19th century, which as well as a 17-volume report also produced a series of maps colour-coded to indicate levels of wealth and poverty in different streets. However, it's proved hard to persuade other course tutors to use the collections in their teaching. Although many express a general interest, they simply do not have the time to design new course content. But opportunities lie ahead. After poor student feedback over a number of years, curriculum development is now a high priority for the school. And an initial indicator of this change has been the provision of funding by the school's senior management for a new Archives in Teaching Award, overseen jointly by the Library and the Teaching and Learning Centre. The award provides funds to support academics who wish to design new courses based on our collections or incorporate them into existing courses. In addition, our, our new Director of Education has an active interest in object-led learning, and we expect this to be reflected in the new education strategy, which is currently under development. The potential for, of our collections for teaching, for university teaching, can be seen by the number of courses from other institutions which use them, 14 last year, and the feedback that we receive from them. So the first comment on the slide here is from a student, and the second from her tutor and they provide clear evidence of the benefits of teaching and learning using original primary sources. Meanwhile, our education officer has been working hard to develop our offer to learners outside the higher education se sector. And in particular, she's developed an offer for schools, and in 2017 to 18, we hosted 23 school visits for learning sessions based on our collections and linked to the national curriculum. So, for example, women's suffrage, poverty in Victorian England, and the development of the welfare state. Most classes came to us as visiting a higher education institution was seen as part of the learning experience. But our education is also, officer is also able to do outreach visits, taking learning resources out to schools. And she's also published online two series of lesson plans for schools based on the sessions that she's run in-house. Over 1,000 children participated in school visits last year, about half in the 14 to 16 age bracket and the re remainder between 5 and 13 years old. Again, the comments on the slide collected from children who'd, uh, who'd visited to, to, uh, to look at material from the collections bear witness to the capacity of original primary sources to engage and inform. We're also keen to see our collections used as the basis for new and innovative research, particularly within the school. Again, our success so far has been limited. Over the, past, over the last three years, our collections have supported three major research projects, funded by UK research councils to the sum of over £1 million in total. One completed in 2016 on the history of the Child Poverty Action Group, whose archive we hold. One ongoing, drawing on the archives of the Management Research Group, an interwar think tank which aimed to improve management efficiency in the UK. And one about to start on the feminist filmmaker Jill Craigie, whose personal papers we hold as part of the Women's Library Collection. However, all these projects were instigated and were or are led by academics from other universities. 
And although there is a steady flow of LSE students and staff using the collections in the reading room for smaller pieces of research uh, and assignments, we've yet to persuade our own academics that our collections might form the basis of large-scale research projects. However, again, there are signs of change. We're currently in discussion with our economic history department about the possibility of a research project based on our collections of economic and social statistics. And academics are also starting to realize the potential our collections have to enhance the impact of their research beyond academia. This is one of the criteria on which the quality of research is officially assessed in the UK, so it's crucially important. The two badges on the slide are from the archives of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, a collection which the, an academic in the International History Department is currently using as the basis for a knowledge exchange project on the history of the Cold War. The project will digitise a small selection from the archive and invite LSE academics, activists and policy makers to annotate the documents, thus providing a commentary from a range of different perspectives. The resource will be freely available to the public as well as being used as a teaching resource at the Open, Open University, the UK's largest university. The curator roles are also helping us to collect more actively around our flagship themes. So, for example, in 2016, our curator for politics and international relations planned and managed a small collecting project around the EU referendum. In consultation with the British Library and the Bodleian, who concentrated on archiving websites related to the referendum, we decided to focus on collecting the literature produced by the Remain and Leave campaigns. Often regarded as ephemeral, we believe this material provides valuable evidence of the arguments used by both sides to persuade and influence voters. And the curators are also working with our digital library team to create digital collections. So following the referendum, we digitised the 200 campaign leaflets we'd collected, creating a Brexit collection for our digital library. And we found the process of collecting generated interest in our historical collections on Britain's relationship with Europe. So as well as digitising the 2016 material, we also digitised a selection of similar materials from the 1975 referendum on Britain's membership of the common market, thereby enabling comparisons and contrasts between them. So the new roles have definitely been a positive development, but there have been and continue to be a number of challenges. So firstly, how to measure and evidence the impact of these activities in order to demonstrate the benefit of the new roles and the activities support to, they support. As well as quantitative data, we're also trying to gather qualitative information, for example, by asking visitors to exhibitions to leave comments detailing what they enjoyed or what they learned. And for our Suffrage 18 program of events, we've also been monitoring coverage on social media and print media. However, we're still working out how best we might monitor the impact of digital exhibits or digital resources beyond simply collecting information about the number of page views or downloads. Similarly, although we have data about the number of visits by researchers to the reading room, we have very little information about the outputs generated by those visitors. Citation analysis might be one way of capturing this, but collecting citations of archival material is not as simple as it is for publications. The National Archives and Research Libraries UK are currently working on some initial guidelines, so this is something that we hope to be able to implement in the near future. A second challenge has been defining and building relationships around these new roles and new areas of work. So firstly, there's been a degree of tension between the curators and some other members of the archives team. With the benefit of hindsight, managing the recruitment of the curator slightly differently might have eased the difficulties. There was a lot of emphasis around the, the time of recruitment on the role of the curators as collection experts, which alienated some long-standing members of the archives team who've been working with the collections for many years and so built up a considerable body of knowledge. In retrospect, I think we could have emphasised more that the focus of the curator was to build knowledge of the collections in order to encourage and facilitate their use, in contrast to the archivists, where knowledge and understanding of the collections informs the creation of de descriptive catalogues to facilitate effective discovery and access. 
There have also been points of tension between the curators and the education officer, as it's not always been clear how their roles dovetail together, particularly in relation to learning activities. The posts are based in two different teams managed by two different people, and while exhibitions and public events are coordinated and overseen by a cross-library working group, no similar structure currently exists for learning support activities. And while the education officer and the curators sometimes tread on each other's toes, the relationship between the curators and the academic support librarians is still rather distant. We had envisaged that the two roles would work closely together to engage academic departments with the collections and develop ideas for collaborative projects. But this has been slow to take off, perhaps because so far, as I mentioned earlier, departments have shown only limited interest in using the collections. And the third challenge has been around the discovery of our collections. The collection evaluation will help us to prioritize more effectively the cataloging of uncatalogued collections, but we're also having to think about the quality of our catalogs and how they're presented online. In a nutshell, our catalogs are difficult to use for people who have little or no previous experience of archival research, and this is a barrier to the use of the collections. Our flagship collections are currently catalogued across three separate catalogues, one for the Women's Library Archive collections, one for our other archival collections, and one for books, journals, pamphlets, and other printed work. So on a very basic level, it's not even clear where to begin a search. So as a starting point, we're merging our two archive catalogues into one, streamlining the online search and display screen, and providing better guidance on how to search, as well as advice on getting started with archival research. But this is clearly an area that we'll need to develop and improve more actively in the future than we have done previously. So that's a brief outline of some of the uh, main achievements so far and some of the challenges that we've encountered. And I'm now going to hand back to Martin, who will round things up by saying a bit about our plans for the future. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, so yes, um, our future plans. Um, well, I'd like to say it would be um, uh, tackling all of the challenges that Anna's just outlined and, and solving them all. Um, and I think at, at the broadest level, that's, that's definitely what we would like to do. Um, but in a, a slightly more concrete way, um, uh, I'm, uh, the, the, the things that we, we are currently going to be focusing on um, are uh, picking up uh, and building on the collection evaluation um, and what that, what that has revealed for us about the collections. So um, this was a major piece of work. It took us about 18 months um, to do. Anna working on it, um, being seconded on it uh, part-time. Um, and uh, it has been um, extremely useful, um, very successful uh, in my view. Uh, and also in the view of the, the, the rest of the library's leadership team. Um, but uh, even spending that amount of time on it, um, it has been at a fairly, um, fairly top level. Um, we, we have clarified what our UDCs are and what the, the, the level of priority is and the relationship between the different collections. Um, but that still leaves more work to be done around digging into those collections uh, and making some, some further decisions. But what the collection evaluation has done, and we were discussing this at our leadership team meeting yesterday, um, it has effectively unlocked a lot of the other issues that we have uh, at the moment for the library as a whole. So by having that clarity around uh, what, what, uh, what, are, what are the relative importance of the collections, we can move on to do some more detailed work around space management um, and space planning um, confidently knowing that we have um, a, a firm grasp of what are the most important collections, what they're used for, uh, and what, uh, what we need to retain on site, and what we might need to, um, to, to move off site or to, to take off the open shelves. Um, so uh, the collection evaluation, uh, we feel, has unlocked that aspect of, of what we're doing. Um, it also leads to some questions around um, uh, continuing acquisition, um, how we make the most of that, um, and reviewing the processes that we have around making selection decisions, um, particularly to, to support those flagship and heritage collections. Um, in, the, in the archives and special collections area, um, uh, a really major benefit 
um, from this, um, and something that we will want that we want to do as a priority um, is to develop a, a much more active acquisition strategy around unique and distinctive co collections. Um, we have in the past um, uh, been very reactive. It's, we've essentially relied on um, people approaching us with um, offers of material, um, uh, a lot of which uh, is generally not suitable or not, we feel isn't of sufficient quality. But now we have this clear understanding of what our, what our flagship areas are. Uh, we want to um, start going out and actively soliciting material so that we can keep up that, those, those subject areas, those flagship areas in the 21st century. Uh, and we need to do some work on working out what that means in a digital environment and how we maintain those, uh, those flagship areas um, in, uh, in, the current, uh, in the current situation. Um, uh, and part of that also um, a, a priority for us um, is, to, uh, is to work out a plan of, to, of, of how we tackle that, uh, those uncatalogued uh, collections that we have. Um, uh, I think, casting my mind back to the, uh, the archive evaluation, um, approximately 30% uh, of the, the, the archive material um, doesn't have online Yes. Online, online catalog, and 14% of it does not have any any catalog at all, not even um, a hand list. So this is this has been a, a long-standing problem for us. But with um, with the evaluation and knowing what our our flagship areas are, we can target our catalog, our limited cataloging resources on those areas which we have identified as priorities. Um, Thinking about curriculum development, our, um, Anna has already talked about the Archives and Teaching Initiative, and that's going to be, um, a, I think, a real um, important area for us uh, with our new, um, our new senior senior person in the school, uh, the pro director for for teaching, who has an interest in object-based learning, and it's a great opportunity for us to to work with her on developing the curriculum and incorporating archives in teaching. Um, uh, and um, we, we do we do think there's a there, there's a really big opportunity there for us to uh, to, to make me, re, major progress. Um, and then finally, um, we we are thinking a lot about digitisation. We have um, lots and lots of commercial partners uh, want to come and uh, uh, digitise our material um, uh, and incorporate them into the commercial products that they're producing. Um, and we, this evaluation has enabled us to identify what are um, the most important things for us. Um, and we need to think about what that means and what we do around digitization. Again, I think it enables us to take back control, um, uh, it, uh, have, take the initiative really in making decisions about um, what we, how we digitize, what we digitize, um, and to establish a roadmap for uh, for uh, the development of that of that digital area uh, and um, in uh, and, and how we develop the, the the digital library that we have um, so those are the those are the sort of areas that we'll be working on um, uh, in the immediate future building on the work that we've done uh, so far um, and uh, I hope that that uh, that gives you a sense of um, uh, of what's been happening over the last three or four years here, um, and uh, uh, that's really the the end of what uh, what Anna and I wanted to say. So we'll uh, we'll be um, we'll be happy to to tackle the the, the questions that um, that you've been that you've been putting through now. Thank you so much. That was a really splendid presentation, and I especially appreciate you sharing, uh, frankly, some of the, the challenges that you've encountered. I think that those are sometimes um, some of the most useful learnings from uh, an undertaking uh, such as you've, you've had uh, there at LSE. So we do have, um, we have about nine minutes for questions, which is great. Um, and I see some questions in chat, but I want to encourage others to please um, uh, be, uh, submit questions to all participants so that we can all see the questions. Um, and I will uh, read them out for our 
our presenters and hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, so Stephen Hearn from University of Minnesota asks a question that was very much on my mind um, as you were uh, talking, and I think you, you hinted at this a bit in talking about um, uh, the existing uh, catalog and challenges with discovery. But uh, does the new focus on um, the unique and distinctive collections prompt a review of metadata practices and new ways to connect resources at the thematic level? Um, I think I'm going to turn to, to, to Anna um, uh, as the expert in this area. But I think um, just before I do that, I would say um, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, and I think it's one of the you know, one of the, the, the opportunities that this, this, that this work um, provides, but, but, but Anna, what, what yes, do you think? Yes, no, it, it, it does. That's absolutely true. It's a good question, and it's absolutely true. Uh, we haven't really got very far with other than sort of, uh, I suppose, making quite basic improvements to, to the existing catalogues, uh, but it is, I think it is important. It's something important that we will need to address uh, if we want to make our catalogues more intuitive and, and simpler to, to use. Uh, just to give an example, I suppose, we have the Archives of the Force of Society, which is the, the, the main uh, pressure group campaigning for gender equality in the UK. The archive is catalogued on, uh, uh, on uh, the archives catalogue, the Women's Library Archives catalogue, printed publications issued by the Force of Society, so pamphlets, annual reports, magazines, are all on the uh, are all catalogued on the library catalogue. So it's a split collection, and unless you understand uh, uh, unless you understand uh, sort of that, it, it's very difficult to um, uh, it makes it harder to to find things. Um, we've also got a lot of rare print material hidden in archives catalogues, so, so pamphlets in particular that have come in as part of pamphlet, uh, as, as archival collections, and simply been catalogued on the archives catalogue uh, as part of that collection. So they don't appear on union catalogues like COPAC or, or WorldCat, they're, they're hidden. Um, so yes, definitely. I think what we're thinking about for the moment is doing more, I suppose, more advice to people on how to use the existing catalogues and also doing thematic guides on the website to try and kind of bring together, bring together some of these materials that are uh, sort of dispersed across uh, different catalogues at the, at the moment. But I think in the longer term, uh, it, it's something that we'll need to address in more detail. Yes, and I think, uh, and I think, I think just 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 at, at, the, at the broadest level, I think ultimately that you know where we want to get to is that we incorporate the archive catalogue with the main catalogue, and we you know, the, all the material is presented in a, in an integrated way. Um, it you know that's the way to get the most out of it. Great. Um, uh, so uh, Fern Brody asks, um, I was wondering how exactly the collection evaluation was done and how difficult you found it to implement your four hierarchies. This is um, actually a discussion that I find quite interesting. Uh, Martha Conway and I, a couple of years ago, uh, put out a report on collections assessment and, and using kind of scorecards uh, to, uh, to help um, balance and prioritize different uh, functions of um, arch archival collections management. And so I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by, um, uh, by the tools you used and the basis by which you uh, you rated and ranked various things. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that as the person who led the, uh, the, the the collection evaluation project. So it basically, we used three different, uh, or there were three different elements to that project. The first was a significance assessment, um, uh, which focused mainly on the archival collections. Um, but then opening it out to the, the, the kind of print collections as well, but initially the archival collections, um, which use the, the, I think there are various sort of significant uh, sort of methodologies uh, sort of around, but applied those um, to the archival collections uh, and rating them uh, uh, by, I suppose how, in particular, I suppose by how they related to, to, to each other. So we could draw out the main themes of the collection uh, and work out really where our strengths uh, sort of were. Um, secondly, we did a profile of the print collections, looking at um, uh, usage, um, 
uh, rarity, also the age of publication, date, uh, subject, uh, whether it was possible to, to do that, uh, just to get an idea of um, uh, those different, uh, how those, um, just to get an idea, I suppose, of how different parts of the collection had different profiles. And then finally, we did a collection mapping, which looked at, uh, gathered information on the teaching and research interests from, uh, at LSE, so on teaching interests from the reading list system, on research interests from the institutional repository, and on academic profiles um, that are available on, online, um, and mapped that against the, the, the subject profile of, of the collections. Um, so essentially, that's that's the sort of that's the short answer. And I suppose one of the difficulties was um, uh, dealing with the collections at that very broad level. So not going down to not trying to go down to, to individual items and dealing with collections that were quite perhaps uh, 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 different parts of the collection that perhaps contained a mixture of different uh, different items. And I think there is work to do on kind of drilling down to a more detailed level, um, uh, perhaps even down to, to item level. Um, but this gives us a broad kind of plan to work within. I, I have a related question to the, um, to the assessment, which is uh, in the course of doing your assessment, did you find collections that really didn't uh, fit within your scope? And um, are you considering uh, reappraisal or deaccessioning um, any any materials as a result of your more uh, recent analysis. Yes, we did find collections that were were sort of outside, uh, fell outside sort of scope, uh, and we have already deaccessioned uh, some of them. Um, by transferring, uh, more, not, not in a strategic, I guess just taking opportunities as they arose to transfer them to institutions that had uh, a more uh, a particular interest in those collections or the themes that they dealt uh, with. Uh, so more opportunistic um, uh, rather than strategic, um, although it is, I suppose, it, it's something that uh, in due course we might um, uh, we might approach more strategically, um, but uh, but that's not an immediate priority for for um, uh, for the immediate uh, future. Thank you. Um, we have another question from uh, Stephen Hearn on the on the exhibits. Um, uh, is the work on developing, presenting, and gathering gathering feedback on exhibits being uh, archived in some open and durable way? And I, I had a related question, which is, um, is the assessment that you're doing, uh, the, the lovely, um, were, you, were you doing similar work before, so do you have uh, kind of benchmarks for, for how well you're doing sort of before and after you made the shift? Uh, and, I, and I realize that maybe this is such a new shift that it's new, new practice entirely. Uh, so I wonder if you can see some changes there. Um, I suppose we've collected for quite a long time numbers of, for example, users in the reading room um, and the number of items being issued in the, the, the reading room. Um, so there's some, but not really, we haven't previously collected any information, any sort of feedback from um, uh, from teaching sessions that, that we've done, so so that uh, that more qualitative information, I think, is something is something new. Um, in terms of archiving the um, uh, the feedback on on exhibitions, uh, each curator at the end of an exhibition, they will write uh, in effect an impact report, which will um, uh, which will summarise, I suppose, what they feel the uh, summarise the evidence, I suppose, that they've collected um, uh, on the impact of the exhibition and feature. Uh, some or sometimes all of the, the, the comments from, from the visitors' book. Um, uh, so, yes, we are doing, I do, I'm not sure about schools actually, um, but certainly the exhibits we are. Yeah, so, we, so we, we, yes, we're doing, we're doing something to collect that um, and, and uh, record it for, our, for ourselves. Um, we haven't done anything with it um, 
beyond that, uh, and I think it's a, it, it's a good question, and I think it's um, it's an area where I think there is quite a lot of interest um, in the community um, uh, more generally, um, and I think there there is some scope for us um, at some point. Uh, uh, a little bit further down the road, when we've when we've gathered a bit more evidence from uh, from um, uh, the the exhibitions that we've been doing, to uh, to to put it together and to to, to share it um, to share it more generally, and and, and we I think uh, it's it's a good one and makes me think about looking for some opportunities to do that, um, you know, either either online um, uh, in a, in a conference setting or. Um, uh, some other way, but uh, yes, I think that uh, there's a lot of quite rich evidence that we're um, that we're managing to collect. And I think it would be good to to, to share that in some way. So um, yes, thank you for that. I think we'll we'll um, we'll take that away and think about how we could do that. Well, we are actually past time. This has been such a um, uh, intriguing and rich discussion, and I want to thank uh, Martin and Anna both for your. Uh, for, for sharing with us. Um, I understand this is the first time that you've presented on this externally, and we're uh, very pleased to be the recipients of your, um, of, of your knowledge and, and all of your reflection on this work. So I want to thank you both so much for your um, presentation. Thank our audience members for their contributions and for the discussion. And uh, this webinar has been recorded. We will be distributing that soon. And um, thanks to all. This concludes today.